Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today I want to touch a very integral part of our life called leadership. Now, generally everyone has questions. And the ultimate question of every topic discussed is definition. Who is a leader? Right? What's the answer you give? A leader is somebody who either leads or can run or act uh, to give direction, to give inspiration, to give answers, either to a group of people, yes, they say, but also most importantly and primarily to the self. It's the act of leading, giving direction, inspiring, and many other things that are involved in there, but at the end of the day, to a group of people, but most importantly, to the self. When we talk about groups of people, they are broken up in institutions, in organizations, in groups, in ethnic groups, in tribes, in skin, in color, in all sorts of association and affiliation. If somebody can give direction, if somebody can go ahead of them, right, and kind of stir an end of a desired goal. That is a what? A leader. Why am I using these simpler definitions? Because if you go on Google and Google leadership, everyone has an idea of what leadership is and everyone has a definition. But I believe that everybody here inherently has an idea about what leadership is and what it means to lead. The most primary distinction that everyone should live with this evening is you go ahead of people. You go ahead of people. You go ahead of people. You cannot be a leader when you're not ahead of the people you lead, the organization you lead. You cannot be a leader when you're not ahead. And this might not be the physical sense of being ahead, but there are many things that define being ahead. Either you can be ahead in knowledge, ahead in intuition, ahead in wisdom, ahead in experience, regardless of what it is. You are ahead. Now, there is a fundamental question I've had everyone ask, or many people ask themselves. Are leaders born or are they made? Huh? Leaders are both made and they are both born. Right? They're both born and both made. Some people are born leaders. If you're a Bible leader, John the Baptist, the Bible says the spirit filled he was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. Are you seeing that? He was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. Alright? So he was born that way. Are you hearing me? Now I'm going to dispel a thought that many people have had for so many years and I'm going to prove it by scripture. For everybody who has a relationship with God, huh? For everybody who believes in God, that person must believe that they are born a leader. Why? Because it's impossible to believe God and not lead. Deuteronomy 28 verses 13. The Bible says the Lord will make you the head. It's impossible not to be a leader. He says the Lord will make thee the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and shall not be beneath. When you have a relationship with God, He will make you. He will make you. You are a leader. If, when you, if you say, I'm born again, what does it mean to be born again? I'm not talking about a religion. I'm talking about the fact that you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You're born a leader. Who understands what I'm saying? Because you are born again. You are born a leader. Every believer here 
is a leader. Whether you see it, whether you feel it, whether you've been made or not, you are, you are born again believer, you're born a leader. Mugamba Amina. But that's not what makes the leader a leader only. If you're a reader of the Bible, Matthew 19, 12 says, For there are some eunuchs which are born from their mother's womb, and it says, and there are some which are made of men, and there are some which made themselves. He's talking about the three facets that make you the complete leader. There is the part of you that is born. There is the part of you that people you meet in this world will make in you. And there is a part of you that you will make of yourself. Those are three facets and they are important. There is things my mother knew I was before I was born. She told me these things. And all of these things have come to be because the Lord spoke to her about my call and who I was. Right? But there are things also that have made me a better leader, a more effective leader because of the people that I have met in this life. Some physically, some through television, some through media, some through many things, but they have been a, pay, a big, big part of what makes me the leader, Grace Rivega, of Fanero Ministries. They might never stand on my pulpit. You might never know them. Some of them are dead. We only read about them, but they've had a, re a very positive effect on my life. But also, there are also things that are in my personal space, right? That are not so much of the making of other people, but also, in a way, principles make me. Are you hearing me? For example, diligence. The Bible says, See us thy man diligent in his work. What shall he do? He shall stand before kings and not before mean men. It is impossible for a man to be diligent and God does not attract certain people to you. Greatness recognizes diligence. Never forget that. The spirit of greatness recognizes diligence. The meditation of the spirit of greatness it's not a visitor of diligence. It stays with diligence. There are things that even if you were, you might not even be the best at a thing, but the fact that you carry the diligence of the Spirit, there is something that comes when a man is consistent in a thing. Somebody saw an hallelujah. Are you following me? There is something that comes with diligent men. That's in your own doing. It's in your own space. It's in your own space. Now, if I ask, for example, what are those things that go for skills and qualities of a good leader? A good leader is what? A good communicator. A good time manager. Integrity. He's proactive. Thank you. Uh-huh. Good character, right? Uh-huh. Lead by example. Uh-huh. Patient, valuable, you know, as a person of values. When people call me, for example, to talk about leadership skills, I take time not to just simply mention the obvious. Why? People know these things. People know these things. If you're talking of types of leaders, people know types of leaders. They are autocrat leaders, they are democratic leaders, they are charismatic leaders, they are bureaucratic leaders. Then there are those ones who also just appear because of, uh, they are called circumstantial. Eh? Just circumstances put someone there. If you're talking of types of leaders, we sort of have ideas. Again, with a little education, these things you know. If I say, what makes a good leader? You mention these things of head. But now allow me to talk to the African in our space as Africans. Allow me to speak as Africans. Nobody in this room can doubt that the biggest problem in Africa is leadership. Nobody can doubt. Nobody can debate it. And the consequences are seen. Corruption. Don't worry, there is good news coming. Eh? But I must first begin from a continental level. Right? Disease. There are many things that through leadership disease can be fixed. Poverty. 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 More than 400 million people on the face of Africa live below a dollar. More than 400 million people on the face of Africa 
live below a dollar. Do you know what that means? Some of you, you see, when you're talking about wealth, you compare yourself with your next neighbor. They have a car, you don't. No, there are more than 400 million people on the same soil you're standing, the same shore you're standing, that live below a dollar every day. They can't afford the simplest privileges that you even go before God and complain of an emakam of wabu biti. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Eh? They cannot live beyond that. They are existing on the same face. They are breathing in oxygen and out. And they all have brains like everybody in this room. At first you'd think that Africans have a problem with their mind. But they are brilliant brains. Why? Expose them to the same phenomena. Expose them to the same education the kids in England is receiving or Britain, Ireland or the United States. The problem is not our brains. But they've convinced Africans that we are stupid. You understand what I'm saying? But we are not what? Stupid people. We are not stupid people. But fundamentally then, if we are wise men, why is it that we have a leadership problem in the same continent? If the problem is not a mind. 11 of the 20 most growing economies in the world are in Africa. Right? But if you study all these 11 economies, the reason why they are growing is based on natural resources. Gold, silver, what? Diamond? Mention oil. Eh? But that's why they are growing. Are you following me? Now, take away the resources of all these 11 and ask yourself the question, if we walk up in a desert like Jordan or Israel, where there is nothing in the ground, nothing on the ground, nothing above. Again, are you following where I'm coming from? It's not a mind issue. Okay, we've agreed. Granted. But again, the most successful ones are successful by resources which they did not make. They were created by God. Yet the problem is not that. Mind. We're very smart people. Yet we can all mention all these things of head leadership, time consciousness. You talk, just talk about time. Africans, time. You understand? You can even say time management, but even time is an issue. You understand? Four times I've driven off and say, I'm proud. I'm not proud. You tell me, Apostle, you're standing on the pulpit at six. I drive to the church at five, right? And it's 9 p.m. And even the fellow who is invited you is not there. So I am going to A little sleep, a little slumber, and poverty will pounce on you. We are blaming the government. So I am going When they tell me be down at 6, by 5.55, 5.40, I'm waiting for the person to pick me. If you don't keep time, it's offense. I am going to do you understand what I'm saying? But it beats me that this is the same continent that carries the biggest slogan on the face of the earth. Ubuntu. You are because everyone is. I am because we all are. You, you follow what I'm saying? Eh? That means there are things that should not separate us as human beings, but they consequently again still spell somehow later define us differently when we come on this continent. And sadly, this color. Sadly. I was talking to boys today who were talking about wealth. I asked them this one question. And I asked them, look, we had a rich fellow here they called Ezra many years ago. When somebody debated Ezra's money, he put money on the table and they took what? Photo. There's a canoe young boy recently. I also saw him in front with a camera. Photo. You understand? It's not only with Ugandans. Bill Gates doesn't put money in front of the what? Table. Warren Buffett doesn't put money in front of the table. But this African man. And I saw him boasting. 
he put his watch in front of him and tell him, this watch is $2 million, you poor thing. You understand? He's a black man telling somebody that he owns a wristwatch of $2 million. Are you following what I'm saying? You see? This is the problem. Mindset. Mindset. We cannot speak of great leaders. I'm not talking about just effective. We cannot speak of great leaders when we are not talking about the mindset. Many people in this continent have a fixed mindset, not a growing mindset. What is a fixed mindset? If you have a talent, if you are imbued by God with a certain intelligence, or perhaps have a certain skill, you never add to it. You never add to it. You position yourself in the thought that you're going to be rewarded all your life because of that skill. Nothing more. I'm talking of the pump attendant. When I was banking in those years, I banked for six years. One time we were banking and then we were doing business. We were trying to reach out to some of the big boys and then we did a list. And then, one of those days, we were following up a very rich fellow, okay? But the most profitable business in Kampala, and that was City Oil. You remember that time? City Oil and Java? It was the most profitable business that year. We left our beautiful offices and went to sell. Why? Because they proved it was the most profitable business in town. Right? Why? You're going to drive to City Oil. Up to now, I don't think City Oil has upgraded to anything. They use basic premium. Right? But the feeling that I'm going to drive to City Oil and the fellow is going to come and say, who's they? Right? And then there are two, three cars down the road and a guy runs to your third car and says, who's they? I have a puncture. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Go sit in there. Let's get a drink, okay? Well, I'm going to clear this. We're going to bring that. Let me drive your car there. Pack it. Do everything, right? And after that, the guy comes. As I'm still taking my juice, he says, we finished, sir. And here is the receipt. I've already paid. Then I sit in my car and drive away. Basic. You understand? Know, Next to city oil was. I remember the day. I'll never forget that day. So I used to love to take fuel at a big power, protecting my car. I drove to Shell one day, packed. A woman came in the window. Yeah. I looked at her. You get her? Take her to our community. After that, she didn't know whether I'm running for an emergency. Nothing. And plugs. Are we gonna sing anga karokori? But now, the many of those ones, busula overnight. The buvayo, bua galakatola, bua galaba sadja, bua galaba, bua galaburi chimo. Smile, Montegera. She unplugs this and puts it back and comes. I give her my money and I give her she walks out. From that time, I started taking fuel at City Oil. Why? Because the guy will say, "Muzi way by." Zio is the zio. You understand? This much. Okay, sir. That, that. And I remember that time. Every time you'd park at City Oil, somebody would say, Hello? Banangi. Banangi. Abo Uganda. Common decency? Kahalo? How are you, sir? How can I help you that I want this much? If you're talking of customer service in Uganda, you go. Some of you have banked. They orient them. Go through the orientation process, we're like we're all oriented, they are taught how to manage customers, enter the bank and see the favors they are doing you. Yet you're the customer. Diligence. Try and again. Then a man also says, no government here. Mindset. The mind is fine, but the setting is wrong. How do you understand that the mindset is wrong? Attitude. Attitude judges the setting of the mind. Attitude judges the setting of the mind. This is happening with people on the same face of the earth. And interestingly, all of the people that usually yeah, are like that, they are poor. 
Simanya muntegera. They are what? Yes, have all your books, do your master's degrees, have your PhDs, but you're going to attract the spirit and form of poverty in its own self. Why? Because there is a seed you're planting. The attitude is wrong. I always tell people, you cannot have idea with a minimum wage ethic. The attitude is minimum wage. You think poor. You're not working for anything. You don't dream for... We don't dream for anything bigger. The black man has always been in survival mode. From back in the day, iron. Hundreds of years ago, iron was first discovered on this same continent. You go read history. Survival. They made spears, javelin, never Rwanda. You understand? Animals were gazetted. Some were killed. Do you understand? Modernization came. They still stayed making spears. You understand what I'm saying? The same man comes on that same continent, gets it, makes a fork, a spoon, a knife, what? Transitions into bigger things, factories, and now cars. Iron was here. You get my point? Now let's talk about leadership. Aren't they leading? Come on, aren't they leading? Aren't they leading? They are leading. They are leading. Okay, yes, we had issues like colonialism. Those things really put us back. You understand? They gave us a certain system of education that was not really as beneficial to us as it ought to, right? Because the logic was limited, analysis was limited, reasoning was limited, cramming was the core. But what were they telling us? They were telling us that answer this education, the Latin educare, is supposed to bring out what is in you, not pump you to answer yeah. on the level of what you've been given. That's not education. Education is supposed to enter you and say, what's the best you are? Can we bring it out of you? If education is not giving that, it's not anyway. The concept is now that People have graduated. How many of you know the ratio of graduates versus them available employment? We graduate more than 50,000 graduates every year. And the job market can provide for only about 3,700. What of the rest? And I mean every year. There are people in this room from the time you graduated in that degree have never gotten a job in that profession. Your parents educated you since you were a little. It's painful. And they have expectations. Parents have expectations. Families have expectations. The nation has expectations. When you get married and have children, they also have expectations. Because this is the continent. Right? What killed our mindset? Where did it begin from? It began from the fact that we were already formed with much. We were already formed with match. And because we were already formed with match, our attitude was, what do we need? These guys, they had nothing. Case in point, I worked in Chikubo for some time. Central. Chikubo, what you were Our business was it. I knew all the rich boys who were doing business down there. But I'll tell you, as in boldly, that almost 70% were not Baganda men. And this was a deliberate research I did for myself. These were Batiga, guys who came from Kabari. And then they came with power and they started carrying stuff. You understand it? From traders, trucks, putting them inside. And the guy becomes too diligent. He saves off his money, right? Then it begins like a small shop and then it transitions into business. You, you understand what I'm saying? That's why you see people who come where they were not born. And I, I want people, if you still live where you were born, you have a problem. As in the same locality. Unless you leave, either education will move you or a job, but something moves you. Why? Because there's a comfort zone hidden in there. You'll never know it, but it's hidden in there. Simaya Montegea. And that comfort zone kills. 
Africans were born with much. That's why the 11 are all succeeding on originally what they were born given with. But the attitude to have much, right, and still maintain an attitude to do more, even when you have much, right? Even when you have much, right? Again, fixed mindset, growth mindset. We are not a growth mindset. We are a fixed mindset. If you go to Europe, Asia, they are a grow, growing mindset. What do I mean by a growing mindset? They know that I have intelligence, I have skill, and I have talent, but it can be pushed and improved. Science has proved it through neuroplasticity. Right? They have now discovered that the human brain can change shape in the synaptics, the neurons, everything can change. Your brain has the ability to adjust to anything and give you things that you never thought you could do to ability if you learn the simplest idea, practice, hard work, commitment, experience. Those things can create this reality. We were in Northern Ireland one time, and there's this guy who's a cyclist. He is a cyclist internationally. He, you know, these are guys who used to compete with the Armstrongs and what. And Johnny told us, every morning, he said, every morning, this man cycles 50 kilometers. Every morning, he cycles 50 kilometers. He's already good. He has something inside him. But there's a little son that keeps telling him, push yourself more and be better, even at what you already have. Muntegera, you have it, yes. You look at African players. You go to African players. If you were a keen uh, person who followed football back in those days, I can give you simple examples. Haji Diof. That boy left Senegal. He entered Premier League. He was the star. He got money. The next thing we hear, Haji Diof is not turning up for training. This African boy, I know Nakuya. You understand? And one time, there was a conversation that uh, Fola, he had about him and a certain guy from Brazil. Robino. Yes. Robino came as a star success and wonder in Premier League. Now Fola complained, he said, we did not have even 30% of that boy's talent. But yet we did way more than he did in his whole lifetime. He said it was painful. Why? Because there was one fellow, again, we are still talking about leadership. I'm not talking about you being a prefect in your school. No. We're talking about global, kingdom understanding. You understand? That you can break a company here and it grows and becomes a corporate and global competitor. A conglomerate that people would look at and say, this was done by a man. He began it from Africa, but with the right attitude. I expect a big gamba, Mina. Robino was a pain. But you go to many of our black stars, Gibril Sisi. What happened to Gibril Sisi? You can mention the few that made it like Okota. Those are special ones. George Weah. Those are special ones. Those are very special. Are you hearing me? But that does not mean that our minds are not great. It only means that when a generation is born with much, right? Their genes adopt and mutate and translate the same things into their own seed. And that seed also breastfeeds that indifference. Now, social media is here, right? We have access to what we could not have years ago. Everything you need is there. Everything is available, right? I have lived the principle for the last 15 years. I have never gone to bed without learning something new. Impossible. I talk about quantum physics, I talk about science, I talk about rockets, I talk about these new inventions, new drugs. New... Sometimes you ask me, but who? But you speak in tongues. Do not think Fanero is just a growing... No, 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 no. You're talking to guys who know everything. You think I don't get intimidated? Should I stand in front of a guy and I don't even know what an income sheet is or a balance sheet? Or, uh, you understand? I can't even understand a simple thing. Moon, you know more, your Holy Spirit. No, there are more than 10,000 churches in Kinshasa. Then? Yes. And it's one of the poorest cities. 
And then you go to Denmark, and there are 57 churches only, <laughs> but locally, and they are successful. There is something we got wrong when we came to religion and faith. We got it wrong somewhere. We got it wrong somewhere. You get my point? Eh? Fanero grew to 2,000 people. When I'm still banking, eight to six. Paul was a tent maker. Paulo Saint Paul. He was a tent maker. Luke was a doctor. Full time. Full time. What do you mean by God has called you full time? So the challenge became that the mindset was wrong in how we respond to everything. Right? Christianity has taught us that we've been blessed with every spiritual thing. In heavenly places, we've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. But the missing ingredient here, we don't understand that that is a responsibility. And that responsibility means if we have to manifest whatever is not seen to the physical, there are principles we can never float. We can speak in tongues, do everything, but there are things we can never go against. And that is what he was trying to say. That people in the world have gotten things, understood the same principles in the Bible. Abraham was a worker. He was a tiller of the ground. Our father of faith. When I'm going to think Abraham faith. I'm going to get it. You get it? He said, I don't put a demand in Angem on President I don't fundraise. Otherwise, I'll start fundraising. I'm 70 on dollar. You understand it? You get where I'm coming from. Because pastors don't want to work. Pastors don't, don't plan as men of God and say, you know, let me plan for my own household. No. No. Are you following what I'm trying to tell you? Leader, sheep. So, I put down 10 things I'm simply going to read for you. And these things you will term them as things that define a great leader. Things that define a great leader. They are going to be statements. All right? Some are written by some men, some are written by me. Praise God. But they are important for you to go back home with. One, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Leadership defines so much when a man is under pressure, when a man is under trial. When a man is under controversy, how do you handle when the evil day comes in your house? That is what defines greatness in a leader. Before you even have any position, that's what defines greatness in a leader. Who is following what I'm trying to tell you? How do you react to things when disaster befalls you? I'll give you the simplest example. We play basketball. Many times, Sports pushes a man's head to the highest level of pressure. There is something that comes out of a man when they are at the highest level of pressure. And when pressure is so at its peak, there are two things that can happen. Right? Intuition or aggression. Who is understand what I'm saying? We are two points behind. We are on running clock of 10 minutes. We are going to win us. And there's a man coming with a ball and he's coming to dunk. And that can agitate me. What happens? I'll foul him. I'll kill him. I'll hit him so hard. And you see fouls in basketball. Very bad fouls. By falls down. Foul. Then it's a side ball because I'm hoping by fouling him, hmm, I'm going to have advantage. Perhaps we steal the ball and go catch up and win the game. That's somebody saying, that I can win at any cost, even if it means to compromise my integrity. But pressure has exposed it. Calamity has exposed it. Adversity has exposed it. Those boys will tell you, I have never harmed a man in basketball. For five years I've been playing with you. Four years. I have never harmed a man. I've never harmed a man. Yes, it looks practically impossible. And I always tell them, Fouls don't win games. You know why I tell them fouls don't win games? Because rules are there to protect men from fouls, so the games are one fair and square. No harm, no foul. 
I was playing a little game with a little boy. And then this boy, after pressure, found himself doing something to want to win. I entered this young boy's head and asked him, why did you do it? Because I had to take him back to think for himself. Why do you think the thing in you caused you to do this so you win? Yet it's wrong. You understand what I'm saying? Leadership comes with pressure. Pressures will come. When you hear us telling you, oh, you know what, I could sit there and they would know I'll be ethical on any given thing. It's not easy. Don't think she didn't have needs. Don't think that there was no times when a short pass was available and it was so beautiful that you could have taken it and nobody knew. Those moments were there. And sometimes the need comes in the time when the opportunity strikes. But the mind to say, I am still graceful, Vega, and I will not do this. That's a great leader. That's not an effective one. That's greatness right there. I'm talking about the seed of greatness. Praise God. Second point. A great leader does not need a title. It's not what's on the can, it's what's in the can. Great leaders focus on what's inside, not outside them. I know why she was saying, oh, we expected you relations introducing the man of God a certain way. That does not define greatness. Give me the mic. Just give me the mic. You'll know what's inside. You understand? Any leader who looks to a title for definition is insecure. Amen. Never forget that. There are people in the ministry who call me apostle. They don't call me pastor. They don't call me grace. I've never said, hey, hey, don't call me grace. Call me apostle. Call me a man of God. Call me pastor. No. One time I met a guy. Some guy told him, pastor. I said, oh, hey, hey. I'm bishop. I am bishop. His glory is in the title. Not the substance that is coming out of him. Greatness. It's not about what men call you. When you learn that, you realize that humility is a spirit. It's not just the temperament you create before those you must please. That's manipulation. It's inside the man. Come on. I have all the right to enter with bodyguards. Those are not the things that define you. Humility does. The Bible tells you he exalts the humble. Do you want to continue going up? Stay humble even with what you have. Stay humble even with what you have. Sometimes I look at pastors, fellow pastors. This guy has 200 people. Oh my goodness. You have to go through 17 people and everybody has to scrutinize you. You have to go through <laughs> that's a matter of time it's a matter of what that's number one two can we go to number three successful leadership is leading with a heart not the head you lead with a heart not the head because brains are not emotional brains are not compassionate brains are not like that they are not mad like that. Who is understanding what I'm saying? They're not empathetic. You lead with the heart. Recently, somebody asked me a question, asked me, what is the one thing, Apostle, that proves to you that there is something so wrong with our generation? Again, there are many right things. Come on. Hello. But there are few things that are wrong. And I told him simply, looking at a bunch of a thousand people, let me call them gomis. You'll understand why I use the word gomis. Standing in front of somebody, speaking perverse language, and it's funny. Who ever knew that would get a time? Where? Foolish boy. One time somebody played me a video for two seconds. I said, remove it. How can people sit in perversiveness and laugh? Where is the humor that comes from the heart? Where is the creativity we saw years ago? Where the fun and comedy was funny, it was stand up, they would say things that were funny but would not offend the spirit. It's because it no longer comes from the heart. 
comes from here. Are you following what I'm trying to tell you? But there are many things that translate to leaders. Because if you're a leader and you don't work from your heart, you don't lead from your heart, many things you will do. But let us spell many things that not only will have an effect on you, one of the strongest is instinct. What does your heart, gut tell you? Right? What does your gut tell you? The Bible says that if the ruler follows lies, Proverbs says, right? If a ruler follows lies, his servants become wicked. Now, put yourself in a business. Right? If you don't follow your heart, everyone will come with every word. You understand? That's why some people ask themselves, why is it that you can come and bring me a report on somebody? And I say, you know what? Let me pray about it and take your time. I just take time and not respond. And some even have problems. But you're not dealing with this. Apostle, how can you not deal with this? Because you see, there's a reason why I'm here. I, I lead with the heart. Sometimes I have to go to God and say, Mkama, watch or no? But is it true? Why has she done what she has done? Are we dealing with a problem that began when she was little? If we expel her now, will we deal with the issue that happened when she was little? There's a young girl, her father wanted wealth and sent a man and abused her when she was young. And she came in ministry and said, doing all funny things. Some people used to ask themselves, why are you tolerating her? I knew the story. I knew the story. At least if I fall out with her one day, she will know as a pastor I tried. But I had to follow my heart. But everything in the head was telling me, get rid of her. Get rid of her. I don't know whether I was right to get rid of her or not, but my heart kept saying, no, be patient with her. Some change. Some don't. But I've just given an example. And as a ruler, right, leadership attracts. Are you following what I'm saying? And when it attracts, it attracts every kind of person. And people who want to get to you, that's the spirit of Jezebel. She's always attracted to power. And she can only submit to what she can control. And she will manipulate everything to get to the top. There are people, even in organizations you know, who will badmouth others to get up there. Are you leading with your brain or are you leading with your heart? When you're leading with your heart, you'll always know them. A good leader, that's number one. Four makes leaders and not followers yet if he cannot be a good follower he cannot be a good leader did you hear that i repeat it again a good leader makes leaders and not followers yet if he cannot be a good follower he cannot be a leader in other words the end of every leader is to make men leaders but yet you will never make leaders until you become a follower next successful leadership does not put greatness in two people it brings out what's already in them it brings out what's already in them. It does not put greatness in men. It brings what's already in them. If you put yourself in people, they'll become cheap copies of you. But if you bring out the best in them, you're a good leader, great leader. Somebody say, Amina. Next. Leadership is an opportunity to serve. It's not a trumpet to call to self-importance. It's an opportunity to what? To serve. It's not self-importance. You are great to serve. Not to be served. Men will serve you. But never build an idol of their service. If you build an idol of their service, that's self-importance. Build an idol serving them. Praise God. A good leader with the number two. A good leader is about nurturing and enhancing people, not managing them. We don't manage people. We manage situations. We manage circumstances. We manage challenges. We don't manage people. We nurture people. We enhance people. Somebody shout hallelujah. Next, number one. Leadership is doing what is right when no one is watching. Because of acceptance, deep-seated need in humanity. Many people have learned to do many things when they are watched, but they don't do much when they are not being watched. As a pastor, I would come at church and see a guy, and he thinks I haven't seen him, and he's talking with his friend. <laughs> Hello, then you come and say, <laughs> In number of us, praise God. 
when you learn to do what is right, even when nobody's watching, you're great. You're great. You're great. You're great. You're great. Number one. Great leaders don't give excuse. They take responsibility. Did you hear that? Great leaders don't give excuse. They take responsibility. There are even times a leader will take responsibility of something he has not done. That's great. Because you don't need to win with a mass. No. We don't find consensus. We mold it. So we don't need to win with the numbers. We can make the numbers. Are you following what I'm saying? Lastly, great leaders invest much when they get to know how contagious they are. The more contagious you are, the more you learn to invest in yourself. When you start to see people coming around you for no reason, greatness starts to invest in the self. The power of contagiousness, it's undefinable. I'll give you an example. For some reason, some of you remember the young man, Abu Aziz, Tunisia. He just got tired of the government system and put petrol on himself. It contained the whole nation and the coup took place. There was something on that young man many people never knew. Not everyone who commits suicide brings a coup. If somebody taught him the right way, he probably would have led that nation. But he died as a martyr for that nation. Are you following what I'm saying? People can do things. They can even say, no, no, he was mad. Then he just burnt himself because he was mad. No. This fellow put fire on himself and the whole nation raged and the government was overthrown. That's why I want people don't play with certain people. You can play with everyone, but and I even want leaders, when you're a leader, you must know the wisdom to pick certain battles with certain people and not certain people. You design. There are people, even if I fall out with them in the ministry, I will never attack them. I will never speak anything. I will never quarrel with them. I will peacefully let them go. Because I can be right and not true. They mean you don't part ways. Part ways in peace. Have peace with them. You never know who you're touching. About Uganda. Not all bloods are equal. Lamech's blood was avenged 77 times. But anybody who touches Lamech, 77 people die before God starts to think, okay, who caused this? Are you following what I'm saying? Before even God asks who I, who caused this? 77 people die immediately. <laughs> they say, okay, now, who huh? caused it? Why? Because it's Lamech. Yet with Cain it was seven. Even the man who had sinned. There are people, if they die, many people die. Even presidents should know that there are people you don't touch. Any wise president, there are people who can abuse you and you never touch them. <laughs> because they can bring trouble on your life. Great leaders discern that. If you fall out, have peace with them. You know how to choose your battles. Greatness knows. That makes you better. Praise God. You learn to invest in the self when you realize how contagious you are. There is something more so, and this is by the anointing, there is something as the anointing of God increases on your life, eh? it will start attracting a certain favor. Even people you don't know, you will love you. People you don't even connect with will look at you and love you. They will bless you. I found people for the first time in my life and they gave me things even people have passed that for five years I've never given. Yet they had the ability to give. That's the anointing. But you see, the anointing, once you realize that you are that contagious, invest in yourself. Invest in yourself. If you have these things, 
I'm dealing with mindset, not mind. We are tired of looking at Africa the way it is. Do you know why some of us stayed in this land? We see it differently. Our attitude toward Uganda is different. We believe this nation is blessed. We believe it is rich. It has a great mind and mindset. Are you following what I'm saying? And we are changing this nation. And we will change Africa and the whole world. Hallelujah. There's a reason why God gave us these resources. He knew. He knew that we are blessed people. He didn't give them to us to be poor or to become indifferent. No, he gave them to us because he knew we had the mind to use them. Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for this conference. Thank you for the words that are priceless, that have been embedded in our spirit. Somebody speak in tongues. I feel something wonderful is happening to us. Let's receive. Just speak words. Speak words. Just speak words. Just speak words. You take me. You mold me. You use me, feel me, cause I give my life to the poor of hell. You call me, you guide me. Lead me, walk beside me, cause I give my life to the poor as hell. Father, we thank you for the words that have been shared this evening. Every word that has been spoken was spoken to bring out the best in us. That the world will see, even as we go on this journey to discover the self and align it to the purpose with which you have ordained us. Give us wisdom, give us grace, tenacity. We receive every word tonight. We walk out with a kingdom mindset. Kingdom mindset. And we're going to change this world. I see the greatest leaders here. The richest people the world will see are in this room tonight. The most influential ministers the world has ever seen are in this room tonight. The most distinctive graces that have ever walked the face of this nation are in this room tonight. And it's not by mistake that we are here. Father, we receive every word that has been given. Every word that has been said. Our life can never be the same again. Our children will look at us and children's children and say, My father, my mother, he was great. There was greatness. There was a seed of greatness. Amen. He told our father Abraham that I shall make you great. I'll bless you. And we are of his seed. So greatness is our portion. And these principles align us. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Make manifest.